We call this day, this fourth Sunday in Easter, Good Shepherd Sunday, because every year we read the 23rd parable, excuse me, the 23rd Psalm, and we get a selection from Jesus' discourse on sheep in John's Gospel. The image of the Good Shepherd is an easy one to love. We often think about it and easy, easily imagine ourselves as the sheep of Jesus' flock, following our leader as he brings us out to pasture and shelters us in the sanctuary of the sheepfold. But whenever this Sunday rolls around, I can't help but remember a news article I read several years ago. The story was about some shepherds in Turkey, several families who watched their sheep together. Each family had about 20 sheep, and there were something like 20 families. One day, they left the flocks to graze as they sat down for breakfast. And as they watched, somehow it began that a sheep, probably, wandered over the edge of a cliff, falling to its death. Well, because we're talking about sheep, the rest of the sheep followed. 1,500 sheep leapt from the edge of the cliff, falling to their deaths. Well, the first sheep all died. After about the first 500, the rest survived because their fall was cushioned by the ones who didn't. It's kind of a funny story, but it's also tragic. And not just because of the financial loss suffered by the shepherds. Because sheep, you see, aren't exceptionally bright. In order for the flock to survive, they need a good leader a good shepherd. It's sadly all too easy for them to end up following one another to their doom. It's really not that flattering to be compared to sheep in this story. But that's what we are. How often do we end up following thieves and bandits that care nothing for us, but thirst only after their own power or wealth or prestige? Whether it's following a populist leader or remaining complicit in a broken system, we will blithely leap from the cliff time and time again simply because it's the direction the flock is headed. That sheep mentality is why we continue to use up resources at an unsustainable rate, even as we choke on the waste they create. It's why we can't seem to escape the tug of institutional racism, why we haven't yet solved hunger or poverty or war. Try as we might, we continue to find ourselves following things that just keep killing us. When Jesus says that he comes that we may have life and have it abundantly, that's not just good news. That's life-saving news. It's the kind of news that can compel someone to sell their property and give away the proceeds the way people did in Acts. He has come to help us escape the self-destruction upon which we are bent, to turn us back from the cliff, to return to the green pastures where we may graze, and to lead us safely into the fold where we can find peace. The church in the second chapter of Acts experienced this abundant life, and it was so amazing that day by day their numbers grew, swelling with people who saw God's vision for reality and recognized it for what it was who heard the voice of the shepherd and followed. But the church in Acts 2 wasn't perfect. This is chapter 2, after all, not chapter 20. It's where they started, not where they ended up. Not unlike Eden, they began where God intended, but quickly lost that as they got mired in arguments about whose job it was to feed widows and whether Gentiles could be a part of God's family. In short, they fell into the same trap into which we are always falling. We are always more interested in serving our own interests and in maintaining our own privilege than we are with following our shepherd wherever he may lead us. And so we are always liable to run headlong off a cliff. With all the voices calling us in different directions, it can be difficult to discern which ones to listen to. It's easy to give in to following the rest of the flock, to going with the status quo, even if it means heading directly for our destruction. It's so much easier just to keep living the way we do than it is to give up driving or stop using plastic packaging or 
boycott companies that don't treat their workers well. It's so much more tempting to eat the food that clogs our arteries and overtaxes our resources than it is to live sustainably and harmoniously with our world. I mean, for crying out loud, our congregation can't even give up the giant bulletins, weekly worship bulletins that we used to make to reduce the impact on our environment without complaining. All of these different voices call to us. And as they do, Jesus offers us a way to tell them apart. The ones that care about us, he says, come and go through the gate. Those are the things that lead us to abundant life and safety. Now that may seem obvious, but so often it is not. Because although that gate is made for us, it leads us down a hard path. Outside the gate is the hill of Calvary. To get to the verdant pastures we seek, we cannot avoid the place of self-sacrifice and death. In our scramble to avoid these things, we are all too willing to follow the strange voices that promise us another way, an easier way, a way over the back wall or through the hole in the fence. Ironically, it's these strange voices whose only aim is to steal and kill and destroy. They are nothing but bandits and thieves, kidnapping God's sheep for their own gain. The gate through which our good shepherd come, bring, uh, excuse me, the gate through which our good shepherd brings us goes through Calvary, but it continues through the empty tomb to the green pastures and the still waters of God's promised reign. The gate is the way of the cross the way of Jesus. He, when he says that he is the gate, he means that he is the one who reveals to us who the Good Shepherd is, the one who leads us to abundant life. He is the one who unmasks the beautiful but terrible enemies who would use us up and then lead us over the cliff's edge. Leading up to this shepherd speech that Jesus makes is the story of the man who was born blind. We read that during Lent. The story begins when Jesus heals his blindness. And it's after that that it gets interesting. Because now with his sight restored, the man slowly begins to see more and more that Jesus is the one who offers him real hope. He ends up being at odds with his neighbors. He ends up separated from his parents. He even ends up excommunicated from his synagogue. But still, this man finds family and community and security with Jesus. He was, as Jesus says in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, reborn of the Spirit. He becomes a child of God, born not of blood, or the will of the flesh, or the will of a man, but of God. Although his parents and his community and his leaders abandoned him, he still found abundant life in God's family, a family that he will never lose. In that story, Jesus was the gate, revealing who in the man's life cared for him and who cared only about themselves. Jesus says after that, I came into the world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. That judgment is the promise of the gospel, the promise of Easter, the promise of our Good Shepherd, that he has come to pass judgment on this broken world of ours. Those who cannot see any hope in our situation, no possibility of good pasture, will see where the shepherd is leading us and will take heart. And those who do, who do see, who look for the gaps in the fence through which we might slip to get there another way, will be made blind, utterly dependent on the same shepherd for guidance. As the story of Acts continues, we see this fledgling church beset by conflicts 
and torn by division, but through it all they see the joy and the glory of God time and time again. Again and again they are renewed by the experience of God's Holy Spirit. This is the glory of Easter, the glory of the risen Christ. It is the glory that shines through this battered and broken church to give the world a glimpse of the abundant life that God promises for all humankind, for all creation. When we see that glory, we can no longer follow the voices of the idols that promise us an easier way, because that glory reveals them for what they are thieves and bandits bent on our destruction. In the glory of God, we hear our true master's voice, and we follow where he would lead us, to abundant life. Easter is our promise that although the path that leads from the gate is hard, it is ultimately the way of our salvation. When we follow our own ways, when we listen to voices other than Jesus, we will always end up like that flock of sheep that jumped over the edge of that Turkish cliff. Destruction awaits us. But hey, at least we'll enjoy the trip, right? Instead of blindly following the flock, we have a good shepherd who will bring us to pasture, who leads us home again to safety. We have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Just as on that first Easter morning when he encountered Mary in the garden, he continues to call us by name, and we know and hear his voice. <laughs>